YouTube, and we'll get. It's preparing the live stream right now, Adam. When you're ready, and just I'll... give me one of these. This thing, that thing. So standing by, everybody. We'll get started here in just a second. Go ahead, Adam. Hi, Bob. You're live. Hello, hello. Hey, everybody. All right. So uh, welcome. Uh, not only our industry guests who uh, are here to be part of the Film Spark. Film TV Career Boot Camp at Arizona State University. Uh, we want to particularly thank Warren Lewis, the great screenwriter, film professor, okay. who was kind enough to bring uh, these great guests. And I will allow him to introduce all our guests, but just really want to quickly thank uh, Jamie, John, Bob, Natalie, Jewel, and, and Roseanne. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And thanks to Howard Burkons, uh, who created the Film TV Bootcamp to give him, uh, or rather to give the students a leg up, the sort of leg up that he had hoped that uh, he might have had when he moved from Arizona to Hollywood to start his career after graduating from Arizona State University. Uh, and it was just so kind that he did that uh, for you students, and hopefully you can achieve the kind of success Howard achieved uh, as a Emmy nominated screenwriter producer. Um, today, of course, we are also live streaming to YouTube. So I want to welcome uh, all the, the students and, and alumni, Sun Devils out there watching on the Film Spark live stream. Uh, it's just a great opportunity that we have to learn uh, not only professional development skills in the form of this panel that uh, Warren Lewis will be moderating for us with his guests, uh, but also to really specifically learn about uh, what Howard Burkons likes to call catching and pitching, not just pitching ideas, but catching and pitching. The idea being that in order to pitch really well, you also have to catch. You got to listen. You got to interact with the person that you're talking to as opposed to just throwing a bunch of stuff at them. I just think that's such a great expression. We're just so grateful. So I'm going to pass it on to, oh, and I forgot to introduce myself. For those who don't know, I'm Adam Collis. I teach directing at Arizona State University, the most innovative school in the nation for the last five years in a row above MIT and Stanford, if you can believe that. Those in addition to doing astonishing things like the film and TV boot camp, ASU does stuff like, like this right here. This is an emblem for a NASA project called Psyche, uh, which, if you can believe this, this is a USA Today headline where ASU space scientists are helping to design the spacecraft that's going to go find an asteroid that is on the outskirts of our solar system and, according to USA Today, is worth over 10,000 quadrillion dollars. And that's just one of the outstanding things that Arizona State University does, uh, as is the Film and TV Boot Camp. So we're just super pumped, super excited, making it through this difficult quarantine time and getting it done. So I'm going to just pass it to Warren. Thank you, Warren. I'll promptly put on my Sun Devils baseball cap. Which is <laughs> uh, thank you for coming, everybody. And uh, thank you, panelists, for joining us today um it's it means a lot to our people to see people to to meet people that are so very accomplished i'm going to introduce the folks um it's a ponderous t duty for me to introduce these people because uh it's a lot of accomplishment and it, they mean a lot to me personally uh dr welch who is my my professor and my colleague and also a partner i'm getting to you jewel uh, a partner in uh presenting a thing or two at conferences. She was, uh, she's executive director of the Stevens College MFA and in screenwriting. She created the history of screenwriting courses. I've been privileged to speak at a couple of her courses and this is breakthrough work. Uh, it's, it's been really remarkable. She is the co, um, co edited bleh, she co-edited uh, women in film, uh, women in American, women in American history of social, political and cultural encyclopedia. Uh, named to the 2018 Outstanding References list and the best historical materials. Her own work 
uh, it, whether it's her book, uh, Why the Monkeys Matter, which I strongly recommend. My copy is right but over then here. Again, you're so prepared. I know. <laughs> uh, is, is her own work and her work on Touch with an Angel, a show that uh, has exceeded, what shall I say? It doesn't have an ending as far as the viewing audience is concerned. It will always be running. Dr. Selbo saved my life. Uh, when I was thinking about getting an MFA, I spoke to everyone except USC, because that was personal, you know? And um, I went back to uh, NYU, spoke to them, spoke to Columbia, uh, where I did some postgraduate work. And uh, frankly, I, I, was, I became indifferent to the idea until I walked into Dr. Selbo's office. I think, uh, I'm not kidding, under 90 seconds, true story, under 90 seconds of that meeting, and I was worried about, are these people gonna accept me or not? instead of what, whether I was gonna go there. Uh, Jules Selbo is um, in, her own, in, in her own right, she's an outstanding writer. A young Indiana Jones speaks for itself. But Dr. Selbo's academic work is remarkable. Her work on, uh, especially on film genre, uh, as, far, as far as I can know or imagine is the work on the subject. Jules, I recommended your book to folks and I recommended it because I've worn out three copies of it. Okay. And what Jules Sobel doesn't, um, you know, what she does know about screenwriting, it, <laughs> uh, about the genre isn't worth knowing. Uh, Deb, you're next. Uh, Deb Galels is a manager and producer. She is the principal creator of the La Femme Film Festival. She, uh, full disclosure, she's also my producing partner on a couple of projects. And uh, I think Deb and I met in the most ridiculous way, working on a bad movie at the same time, just helping a friend. And it's become a, life, a lifetime professional relationship if I have my way. You know? uh, Jamie Barber. Jamie is an old friend. Jamie and I, again, met on a low budget, uh, semi-dreadful horror movie about 150 years ago. I was a production assistant. And Jamie, what are you, third assistant? Uh, I, was the, I, I was the loader. What they call in England a clapper loader, yep. uh, third, third assistant camera here, and um, he's accomplished something that his work as a cinematographer is remarkable. I can't. I have a list here, and I just think you need to look at it on IMDb because there's just there's too darn much. Um, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, Jamie is. I'm going to blow your horn a little bit, man. Jamie accomplished something that, as far as I know, has never been done since the end of the studio system. And uh, he was working on, uh, I'm going to do this, okay? You know, we're on Covert Affairs. He shot Covert Affairs for a long time. Went all, over, went all over the world eventually shooting that show. And at one point, as I understand it, and uh, he was, correct me if I'm wrong, within any detail, it's not going to be much. They took Jamie aside and said, basically, Mr. Barber, we can't afford to pay you anymore as a, a cinematographer. So Jamie thought he was being fired. When in fact they said, so we're going to make you a director. So they sent him to directing school, and Jamie has been uh, directing a lot of network television and uh, major television ever since, in addition to shooting it. Natalie Michelle, my classmate and pal, we know each other so well, we both have nicknames. Uh, it was, was my classmate at Fullerton. And I think stars fell on our class, as they say. Uh, Natalie is doing what you guys are doing, and she's done it very well. She also made a hell of a series. On her, I refer, of course, to Boink. Is Natalie is Boink available still? Yeah, it's uh, on YouTube actually. So it's, when you're done with all this, out. guys, later today, <laughs> go check it out. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was a remarkable class, and Natalie was an outstanding member of that class, and. Uh, she has a mischievous sense of humor and remarkable insight and a lot of talent. Bob Engels, Mr. Engels, uh, I don't have your official biography in front of me. So if I skip the part where you uh, played Fred Flintstone in the Broadway yeah. musical, just let me know. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm here by mistake anyway. Everybody else sounds great. You know? <laughs> uh, Bob is a very accomplished uh, TV and uh, screenwriter. Uh, he worked with that guy who did that TV show. What was his name again? Oh, David Lynch. Yeah. Worked with David Lynch and uh, 
Still, yeah. still work with David Lynch. Still working with David Lynch and still very active, well, still very active in the business. Uh, Bob was my professor as well. And uh, Bob did two things that uh, I, I have discovered uh, doing a little teaching myself that I think professors should do, which is to say, give you a, as much inspiration and teach you and help you get the hell out of the way, out of your own way. And that is, um, that's a quality that's not easily reproducible. So I brought everyone here to talk about pitching, to talk about your best, worst, or most memorable, memorable pitching experiences. I will take the excuse of being the moderator to leave myself out of the beginning because I'm still thinking, a lot of my pitching stories are nightmares. So, uh, and we all have those, of course. So Jill, what have you got for us in a pitch story? Well, um, I had to think about this very quickly. There was, there's some really, when I hit Hollywood, um, the studios were still very open to just someone walking in, pitching. Mm. You could get a deal in the room. Um, they would go, go ahead, go away and write. We'll talk to your agent. Right. You know, we'll figure out how much we're paying you. I walked into um, Disney one day with a biopic about um, Aggie Underwood, who, um, I was the first chief head person at the Los Angeles Herald, which when the Los Angeles Herald was still there. And it was a great story of rags to riches and being a very, very smart woman. And they bought it like within, you know, 10 minutes into the pitch. And, um, and the reason they did it is because Goldie Hawn at that time wanted mm -hmm. to do dramas. She was of a certain age now and she wanted to do dramas. And then, so I went through the whole thing. We, I did like several drafts. It was really, really exciting. Everybody was gonna go ahead with it. And then Goldie had a drama come out, kind of a thriller thing that just tanked. So the Disney decided, oh, well, uh, Goldie can't do drama. So we'll just put this one aside. Um, okay. Yeah, other pitches. Um, you know, sometimes I think you go in there and you go, I have to be different, I have to be different. And that's not really what it is. What you want to do is go in there and get someone to relate to the story and see themselves in the story or see them for them to see other people seeing themselves. So yeah, it's great to have a high concept, but the characters are what's most important. That's what I said this morning. <laughs> oh, you guys have already been in class all day? All day, all day oh, yesterday. My goodness. Too. Yeah. Um, let me see, Deborah. You, you've been pitched to a lot. Have you ever heard a great pitch or a dreadful one or an oh, outstanding? I, all the time, and I also pitch a lot in my sure. life too. So um, you know, I would say that my best experience, as far as um, you know, going and pitching you know, again with um, Donald Stewart, who was an Academy. I hate it when they freeze. Deb, you froze a little bit. I'll tell you what, uh, we'll come back to you in a minute and maybe you can turn your camera off when we come back, just for that, leave your audio on, we'll do it. Um, let me see. Natalie, have you had any pitching experiences you care to share with us? We'll come back to you, Deb. Um, actually, I'm probably- Okay, yeah. okay. do you want me to talk? No, just, we'll, we'll, uh, Natalie got rolling, so we'll come back to you in just a second. You froze for us. So we're doing me? Yeah, we're doing you now. Okay. Um, I'm mm -hmm. actually, my experiences pitching are probably a little different than everyone else's just because I haven't had as many opportunities to get in a room with someone to pitch to, but that hasn't stopped me um, from creating content. So I guess that's how I am a little different uh, instead of waiting to get into a room or hoping to get into a room because it is really hard, I end up just making my own content and putting it out there. And that's actually how I get a lot of um, work. So Natalie, it, it may, those are kind of my pitches. It may or may not interest you to know that uh, I've saved everything that the class did. So in preparation for this, I actually reread a couple of things that you did for, uh, for our class. Oh. <laughs> nice stuff. <laughs> Deb, in case you freeze, just turn your camera off and we'll listen to you and then turn it back on. Okay, so am I freezing now? I'm okay. No, you're good. Okay, great. So I would just say that, you know, like 
obviously the time when you sell the pitch like in the room and you know you do when they say you know the business affairs that's always the best you know i mean i've had you know you and i've gone to some really weird like the time we pitched lucas foster in 2010 that was a horrible pitch you know that's true i've i've i've, I've suppressed it repressed it completely right i mean so i mean it's a, a lot of it depends on you know, when you get the person, you know, if it's a good day or bad day, but I will say yesterday I was on a two hour Zoom call because I'm taking out a TV pitch and, you know, I had the two writers and the two other producers and they were rehearsing and, you know, this is material that's amazing, but the writer who's very accomplished and I will say is, I'm not going to say who it is because you probably all know him, but, you know, he just, you know, like he gave us way too much info you know, and like, so, you know, we have to go back over it again and say, you know, you have to like characters, some nuances, you know, some of the main points, but you have to give the um, the pitchy room to ask questions. Cause if you just spew a lot of info at them, you know, mm -hmm. they might, but I found myself, all the other people were saying, you're great, you're great. And I was going like, I was like, I, you know, it was just way too much. And then afterwards the produce, you know, we talked to them and told them that they really needed to like get it down and that you know you, you can't like you just can't give every little beat and every little you know twist and turn because people will lose you so you kind of have to de you know develop a delicate balance of you know intriguing characters to pull you in and then enough information where you want more but not too much to where you know like your head explodes um I have a permanent injury to um, my rib cage from pitching with Deborah, and they're all like, <laughs> and uh, my attorneys will see you in the morning. Uh, um, let me see, Bob. What well, do you think? Yeah. Uh, I've had lots of terrible pitches, and uh, I've done a lot with in my career. I've done a lot with uh, being the writer with the director. That's kind of my slot you know, and uh, um, I can remember one, uh, one pitch uh, that Lynch and I did, we went to the, whoever was running ABC then, and we got in there to talk about this series idea. And before we could start, uh, David says to the guy, um, uh, is, is that a 1933 Timex you're wearing? And he said, yes, it is. And they talked about watches for about five minutes, 10 minutes. And then this guy turned to me and he said to me, uh, on time and under budget, right? And I said, right. And he said, okay. And then he went back and talked about watches for another 15 minutes and we sold it, right? Great, that's great. <laughs> and it was, on, it, well, it was on the air, you know, it was called on the air, but- uh, um, I'm telling you. Um, yeah, but my experience, like I said, had been, uh, partners with that, so it's a it's a little different because they're uh, they're often trying to get in business with that director, or uh, uh, yeah, I guess that'd be the best way to put it. They're they're already interested in that, so it makes it a little easier. Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, I had another another occasion where we were talking about some project, and uh, I think it felt sure felt like we'd sold it. And, and uh, I kept trying to wrap it up, you know, it's 10 minutes, they're, they're for it. And the director I was in with said, um, you know who would be great for the, the, the woman in this? And he mentioned this actress's name and the room just went ice cold, ice cold. <laughs> and I thought they were being funny. So I made another joke about her. And when we left, I said to the person outside, the assistant, I said, what's, what's the deal with her? And the assistant said, uh, they used to be married. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that was like a pitch that went like five minutes too long. <laughs> um, Good heavens. Uh, <laughs> Amy, what do you got? For? Jamie, do you have anything for us? I'm, I'm sure you do. You've heard my pitches for one thing. I have definitely heard your pitches. Yeah. Um, I've only actually, really, honestly, I've only pitched two projects. One, uh, we did one to MTV that uh, a friend of mine, actually a friend of yours as well, Warren, Alan and I came up oh, with. Yeah. And um, I was very lucky enough that at, the, at that point in time, I was working with MTV. 
on a, on a shooting a project for them. And I got to know the production executives very well. And while we were sitting on the set in front of the monitor, I started, I said, I've got this idea. And he said, all right. He set me up into another meeting and we, uh, we went pretty far until we had, uh, it ends up that MTV had an issue with um, actors hosting a, a, a show. And so we fell apart. And then the other one was uh, with Netflix and we're actually still in, uh, and that we're at least in the second stage of the, uh, cool. of the pitch. They, uh, they bought it or at least they, they're interested in it and they've uh, sent it upstairs. But for me, it's, you know, I go in pretty well, uh, not being, not as a writer, but I go in pretty well organized. We have, again, I tried to suck them in with the story and then normally we have it budgeted and ready to go so that we can that's strong give them everything that they need information wise to at least and get me while you're speaking, to, speaking to our students this afternoon i'm sure they find it interesting to talk about on set collaboration when when you're shooting or, or directing something i mean that because that, that that's storytelling too it's an important part of storytelling oh absolutely you have to i mean we it's it's when Depending on what the project is, you know, sometimes you've got you've got an actor who just says this is not what I would say, and then I, you, at that time, you know, I need to turn to the writer to help me out as much as possible in those situations if I can't if I can't so fix you tend to I can't fix the the directing wise. What's that? You tend to the nearest to the writer, which some of done it. There is one. I'm kidding. Uh, well, as, uh, normally in television, in television, there's always a writer. That's true. He's usually my executive producer. Mm -hmm. So I've always- It's a writer's medium. Yeah, it's, it's well, we call it the writer's way of getting even. <laughs> because Roseanne, in, in Roseanne the, you've heard him and, and you've heard him and you've done him. What do you think? In, in the feature world- Sorry, I, I, I was talking to Roseanne, but you know, I, I interrupted you, Jamie. Roseanne? That's and, okay. In the feature world, you know, the writer is usually we bought his, we bought a script and and we've moved on and and at that point I can make whatever changes I want and and things like that. But Very reassuring. In the TV in the TV world, no, you can't because it's like you said. My my executive producer is usually is usually the the writer, so they have a they have a very strong opinion and they sign my checks. <laughs> <laughs> So Roseanne, what, you've heard him and done him. What do you think? I'm going to say that my advice is always that you should have taken a psychology class sometime in your life because you have to read the room that you're in. Um, and, and so I have two very quick stories. The successful one has to do with the fact that people forget, even when they get a job on a TV show, you're still pitching constantly because there's a juggle among the people in the writer's room how many scripts are going to be given away. Some people have contracted for a certain number. And then when you're lower on the totem pole, it's like, mm, there's a couple extra at the end of the season. The guy with the best idea gets it. So um, in my case, I was working with a female executive producer and um, there was a guy in the room who I knew whenever I pitched something, he would shoot it down because he wanted the other script, right? Because that's a lot of money that's going to be going to somebody else. So I knew I couldn't pitch in the room because I would lose it. So um, I was smart enough to follow my boss into the one place all the men in the room couldn't follow her, which was obviously the women's restroom. And while we were washing our hands one day, I said, I have this crazy idea. And it was my other, the word reading is very important here because I love to read newspapers, magazines, books. You've got to have a million stories in your head and see how they can suit the show or the work that you're doing. And so I had read about this wonderful, um, uh, oh my God, I'm going to forget his name. I'm terrible. Homeboy Industries. Come on, Father Greg Boyle. That's it's it. Awesome. Father Greg Boyle um, and what he was doing with gang kids in LA. And so I, I literally said, I have three words for you. Teenage, gang, dad. Because we were a show where angels came to the world and fixed your life if you fucked it up. And gee whiz, a kid in a gang kind of fucked up his life. And then he has a baby and he's got to make a decision and drama is about decisions. And she literally said, wow, that's great. And when we walked back into the room together after washing our hands, she said, Roseanne has a great idea. And I saw the guy across the room from me look like he was about to shoot it down. <laughs> and then he realized she said, oh, it was great. And he shut up and I won the script. <laughs>
So one, you have to do that. I, I think uh, the last couple of days, I've told a couple of my personal pitching stories, good, bad, and indifferent. Uh, there's one pitching story that did not result. Well, how about a, I'll do a bad one. Okay. I was, uh, it was this fellow. He's not with us anymore, unfortunately. I will, and I will not name names. Very nice guy. But one of the best things about pitching is when to shut up. And that's reading the room. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Is there's a time to just shush. So I got a meeting with Mark Wahlberg and his manager. They were still doing Entourage at the time. And we went in there and the fellow brought me in. Very nice man. Um, he wore sweatpants and a leather sport coat everywhere he went. So that's the kind of pitching, just blue, blue, blue sweatpants, never got dressed. And he had a, the ribbon of a, of a uh, bronze star in his lapel button, which he'd earned, and a silver star. And I kept telling him, you know, I almost said, almost said his name, you know, Frank, nobody knows what that is. And he said, no, it's going to impress people. Okay, whatever. So we go down there and we're sitting down and I had a story. And I pitched it and one thing led to another and it went great. I mean, it's not, it was not a comedy. It was not a comedy, but it was a drama. But we started getting along and we started schmoozing and everyone was laughing and having a good time. And I was going, you know, it's time for me to go now. You know, that little voice said, get up and leave. And I didn't. And his manager would say, oh, we got to get you on Entourage, man. You are the funniest guy in the world. This is great. And Wahlberg said, yeah, yeah, we got to get him on Entourage. And the guy who brought me, and a little voice said, Warren, guys, I'm sorry. I got money in the meter and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Didn't do it. And because I didn't do it, the person that brought me in there went into his briefcase and brought out five screenplays. and stacked them on the uh, on this coffee table. He said, yeah, we have more stuff for you. And I was dead. I mean, I, I was dead. I mean, call the embalmers. He looks very natural. He's done. And uh, that, that was really disturbing for me uh, because he didn't get it. He didn't get what the process was. And he was a producer, a professional producer. And uh, he didn't get it. When Wahlberg and I have crossed paths once or twice since, and he was as frustrating as hell, he always says, Whatever happened to that great story of yours? That's, that's a bad one. Uh, that, that's a bad one. But you know, it, it all works out in the long run. I think one of the things that's most important in pitching, uh, even if it's not a schmooze fest like that, that was, is being able to read the room. And um, in some ways, that's what stand-up comics do, or improv improv people do. They read the room and they use it in some way or, or they it allows them to inform how what they're going to say have you folks found that to be the case let me say that again i'm i'm actually very i'm lucky because you know i i went to ucla but i didn't study film at all while i was there i uh, my major was psychobiology and i figured that i use my psychology my college psychology more than i use anything else in this business go easy on the biology yeah what's that go easy on using the biology part oh yeah i don't yeah. well psychobio is you know the inner workings of the mind according to the biological functioning which i rest my case helps me some but, um, to but, uh, uh, natalie to natalie's point and roseanne's point um you know right now i'm working on a series where it's all zoom it's all via telephone and they really want the pictures written down and they and they want them short so you know, you as a writer, you're gonna write the whole thing basically because you have to figure out if the story's gonna work, and then you start trimming and trimming and trimming to the essentials. Because if you do, if you give them too much, then the one little thing might jump out. So you don't want to do that. You want to give them enough of an overview, but you know, make sure the theme is there, and um, it's 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 just getting the whole story in your head and then learning how to crystallize it for either a verbal or an on-page pitch. Now, Bob, I, the question was, how important is reading, reading the room, the feeling of when, you, when you're pitching something? I know you didn't uh, get the entire story, but that's what we're talking about. So. Yeah. Well, we got, we got you, you know, you, you go in and someone's in a bad mood, they're always looking at their watch. You just have to kind of take it as it goes. 
and just try to be very, very professional and, mm. uh, and, and make sure that give them the impression that you know what you're doing. Yeah. And, and shorter is better. Don't you think, Jewel? I mean, it's, oh, yeah. you want to be concise and, and, uh, we sold a series once uh, where uh, 20th Century Fox was looking for something to do in Palm Springs, and we knew that. So uh, I was the writer, and I was with the director, and the director said, I'll do the pitch. You just, you, you shut up. You don't see anything. So we walk in and sat down, and the directors, they said, what do you have? And this director said, Tin Cup Cop, right? The movie Tin Cup and, and a Cop. And that's all he said. And we just sat there, right? And there was about a minute pause. <laughs> and finally, they started to ask questions. And then we just told them what it was. But the whole pitch lasted about five minutes and they bought it. But the literal pitch was, was one word. And then we just sat there like, you know, it's like, like you're bluffing in cards or something, you know, pretty interesting. No, and you might go into a room and someone's done you a favor and got you in front of an executive or your agents wheedled your way in and they don't know who you are from Adam. And so they're just doing it as a favor. They want you in and out, in and out. So you just have to not take it personally and just go, um, I know, you know, know yourself. I have a great story. I know what I'm doing and somehow convince them that you're a real deal and that you're a professional. And then, and then you'll be able to get back into the room and they'll treat you differently. But sometimes the first pitch, the, the very, very first time I met with an executive, they thought I was a big Italian guy. Oh. And I walked into the room and they Selbo. said, who are you? And I said, I'm Jewel Selbo. And they said, no, no, you know, we thought you were going to be Vinny, you know? And, um, and <laughs> they just said, and they said, look, we like your story. Um, your agent won't sell it to us until unless we let you do the first draft, but we know we're going to fire you, but okay, you'll do the first draft. And I did the first draft and they loved it. And I ended up doing like 20, this was um, an old show called Tales from the Dark Side. Oh, I remember that show. Oh, yeah. With George Romero. And I ended up doing 20 scripts for these people. But the first time they met me, they had, they just, they had no confidence in me at all. So you just have to prove them wrong. Yeah. Well, and you know, reading the room is one thing. It's also, you have to know who you're going in to meet. So like Bob said, you don't make the mistake and reference their wife, which is never useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got sent to a thing once. I had a partner for a while early on and she was from LA and I'm from Cleveland. And my theory is if I had to get somewhere in LA, I was there an hour early at the nearby coffee shop. I don't want to fuck with traffic. And the problem was she's like, I've lived in LA all my life. It's a 15 minute drive. We don't have to rush. So we were 45 minutes late. And it wasn't even worth going in the room, except I wanted them to know we'd at least shown up. So we told the wow. assistant, she's like, oh, my boss is still free. You can come in. So we started off in a bad place. We probably should have said, thanks, let's reschedule. Then we started talking and we're just having a casual chat, like Bob was discussing. Somehow cheerleading came up. I was never a cheerleader. I'm the girl who like went to the football game to see the guys in the band because they were my boyfriends. I was in the band. And I said something shitty about cheerleaders and the woman I was pitching had been a cheerleader <laughs> and now i'm like oh foot and mouth twice um somehow smoking came up and you know who doesn't think smoking is a crappy idea except the woman i was pitching to <laughs> grew up on a tobacco farm in kentucky i mean we knew it was dead but you just keep talking because you're supposed to and then finally we came to oh that movie indecent proposal the one where Robert Redford offers Zumi Moore a million dollars to sleep with her, and that's a big question. And my personal opinion was always that was the dumbest idea for a movie ever because I get Robert Redford and a million dollars. There's no question about that, right? And my husband can just deal with it because it's one night and it's me and Robert Redford. So I said that. She had associate produced that movie, but her name was nowhere on the poster because she was a low level person in the production. So everything about that was fucked up because I didn't know who I was going to meet. So you mm -hmm. have to read yeah. up on them and understand. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and the other thing is, you know, never bad mouth anybody or anything. Um, Natalie knows this because we used to meet at Bob's Big Boy um, working on stuff when uh, we were, you know, in LA. And Bob's Big Boy is a hangout and everybody goes there and everybody Great from place. big producers to actors. And uh, Warren and I always meet there too. Okay. And before you say anything, you That's look it. around. <laughs> 
the Steve shoulder chair. Yes. <laughs> oh, the one in Burbank you go to? Really? Yeah. Oh, I love it. Another thing, too, is that, you know, like, um, you know, so I had a pitch at CBS a couple of years ago on a, on a series that was like a mini series that we should have been able to sell because one of the characters was even Les Moonves's uncle. And what, the writer you know, <laughs> decided to, um, well, because David Ben-Gurion, you know, was his uncle. Uh -huh. So, you know, like, um, she started talking about politics and, you know, just dragged the whole thing down, you know, like, and every other word out of her mouth was an expletive. And, you know, like the two, I mean, and the, I could tell the, um, it, that the executive was really engaged and really liked the story, but I had to think that she would have probably felt like, do I want to spend all this time with somebody who's that? Is so like negative and so like, and you know, and yeah, and she was bad mouthing, you know, people and whatever. You know, yeah, yeah. It was like and really it, like it she turned it for herself on something. And my producing partner, Richard Bishop, and I were just like, you know, like in, uh, flabbergasted because, you know, we felt like that there was really something, you know, that could have happened there. So, the rule of thumb is, you know, you're entitled to have any political opinion that you want, but I would not bring it up in a meeting because yeah, it's true. you don't know how it affects somebody. I'm, I misread a room once. Uh, I opened my, this, I, I was the one who opened my big mouth this time. Um, remember when The Sopranos was water cooler TV, what they call a water cooler show, like everybody watched The Sopranos? Remember The Sopranos? Yeah. So it was first run was a like second, a third season. And the meeting was on a Monday at a certain network. And uh, I had this pitch and it was that schmooze time. You know, you get a Diet Coke, cup of coffee, whatever. And I just happened to say, say, uh, anyone catch the Sopranos last night? And the room turned cold. I mean, just boom, right there. And the executive, and she's still in our business, said, after a long, painful pause, she said, I just want you to know that more people watch our network by accident than watch The Sopranos on purpose. <laughs> and I, and I, knew, <laughs> I, knew, I had blown it big time. And the, the name of that game is, it wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have taken much to find out that was her. Right, that was the way she looked at it. I, mean, yeah, I, I didn't your, know who I was pitching. You know, so I was pitching to a senior definitely. executive, and I that it's like zip. Um, uh, think, Warren, oh sorry, oh, I was no, just no. gonna say. Um, I know this isn't pitching related, but where even, are you? There you are, Natalie. Sorry, even mm -hmm. doing your homework when going in for an interview for yeah. um, a staff writing job or even a writer's assistant script coordinator job is really important because you want to know who and um you're going to be talking to you want to know um if you can do a little research go find their twitter you know, just i'm not saying don't be authentic but just be aware of who you'll be talking to uh possibly a good topic to bring up say you have a favorite show in common you can do that and that's definitely helped me in the past too but you don't so want to you don't want to come off as a stalker there's no, kind of a good balance in there. How right. are the and kids? Basketball games still on? It's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> terrifying. How's your wife? Oh. I saw you guys went on vacation, but um. yeah. Wow. And while you were on vacation, but you know what I'm saying. Though, right? yeah. No, it is. I think it. I agree. I think it's always helped knowing you know knowing the people that I'm going to go talk to, have a little bit of background on them, and find out any commonality that we've got oh, that I have has always worked work. well. And even, you know, even when I'm interviewing for directing jobs, it always helps to, to understand who you are, who, who else is in the room with you, why they're there, and, and then see if I can fulfill their needs. And I think, sorry, one more thing. Uh, I think it works the other way, too. A lot of people who do interview, and I was able to interview a few people um, to work alongside me when I was working on um, the soap opera I worked on for four years. And I was able to go on to their Instagrams because they were public. I was able to look at their Facebooks. I was able to look at their Twitters because I wanted to know who I would be sitting across from every day. And 
I have to tell you that one guy did not get it because he posted weird shit. And um, oh, unfortunately, he had a really good resume, but it just seemed like our personalities or our humor or he just wasn't a right fit for the people that worked in the office that I worked in. And mm -hmm. so keep that in mind when you post things online, it can affect a future job. Yeah, it's, it's a remarkable thing. And personalities play into it. And that's an advantage, I guess, to putting things on paper because personalities will, uh, will, will absolutely, absolutely kill you uh, if someone just doesn't like the cut of your jib. And it happens, and it's, it's strange, really, when you think about it, that we have this multi-billion, maybe trillion-dollar industry that's based on someone walking into a room and saying, look what I've got for you. Um, I think I mentioned it to the folks the other day that a, a pitch is a, it's a complicated thing. On the one hand, yes, of course, the sale, it's a sales document in a way if you choose to make it a document. But it's also a means of clarity for you. After you hear the story out loud a few times, you, you, finally, you find yourself punching the holes in it yourself. And you find yourself saying, well, maybe that's not the story I set out to, uh, to want to tell. That's, that's a part of the process that is, it's enlightening and disturbing at the same time. And the whole notion that you're going to walk into a room and I'm going to wear a blue shirt and the guy doesn't uh, like a blue shirt. I once, so I sold something despite the fact that I wore a suit. Mm -hmm. uh, because I have, I, I happen, I compliment myself. I clean up pretty. I don't clean up often, but I clean up pretty well. I, I think, and I wore my nice, you know, black suit and my boots, you know, and it was looking good. And the executive totally freaked out on me. I mean, it was, it was, uh, I don't mind. It was Lorimar. I don't want to say it. Uh, back when it was Lorimar, uh, the executive looked at me and said, what am I, your father? <laughs> And what do you say? I say, well, I'll do the math if you want, but there's no way of really being sure. Uh, the, it, and we have this gigantic network that's because of that. And I think what, some of the best pitching stories come out, and you, can, you have to look into these yourself. David Chase has got some amazing pitching stories that you can look into. And, and uh, that's a guy, he's like the American, and, and Wiener too, eventually, but David Chase has got amazing rejections. And this is a guy who worked on television shows, I get the seventies, he's working on Rockford Files mm. and uh, Northern Exposure. I think he was a showrunner at one point on Northern Exposure. If and you pre read, uh, there's a book of, of Sopranos, the sort of the making of, and the intro to it was done by Stephen Cannell, who was the first person to hire David Chase to work on Rockford. And he gives this marvelous discussion of how when you get an excellent script submitted to you, you have two options. One option is to throw it in the trash and destroy that person's career because they'll compete with you. And the other option is to hire them because they will make your life easier and your show better and you will make the profit. And he chose to hire David Chase and do that path. And so that put David Chase, he did become a showrunner on Northern Exposure. And of course, then he created Sopranos, which took him seven to nine, I forget which of those two numbers, to Forever. sell. He pitched and pitched and pitched and nobody wanted a hitman who went to a therapist. <laughs> Until he finally, finally, Soprano said yes. So the ideas you own, you own forever. And you never know when you'll be in a meeting with someone and you're trying to sell one thing. And in the conversation, it turns out they've been dying for a show about a hitman who sees a therapist. And you go, mm -hmm. here it is. I've had it in my back pocket for nine years. And I finally yeah. had something to do with it. Because, you know, one of our jobs is to be ahead of the curve. So yeah. if you pitch something today and they go, I don't know. You know, maybe next year it's the perfect time for that show. So never just go, oh, they didn't like it, and then trash it. Just always keep it active. Uh, this, this isn't precisely pitching, but it's process. Uh, I, 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 I go to a writer's conference once a year, La Jolla Writers Conference. They don't pay me or anything, but it's fun. They put me up in a hotel. They don't cover anything. They buy me lunch, and uh, they, don't, they don't cover the bar bill or anything else. But we get amazing guest speakers. And these, most, of the, most of the folks who show up are uh, a handful of screenwriters, mostly novelists and poets and memoirs. What I'm doing there is anybody's guess. And Stephen Cannell showed up one day. In a pirate shirt. I, I, <laughs> it was right before he passed away. And now, I don't know if the wardrobe had anything to do with his demise, but you, know, you never know. Uh, and he told a story about working for Jack Webb. 
that was very illustrative of the process and his process. And it touched me. I'm going to share it because I'm, I'm a lifetime dyslexic. And so was he. And uh, you, it's something you learn to live with. Actually, it can be funny sometimes. Um, when he worked for him, he showed him his pages and they were fine. They, uh, conversationally, Webb said to him, uh, Webb was a piece of work and my idol. You know, Webb said to him, look, I just need you to hand the pages in on time. Do the best work you can. If you're not spelling or something like that, just don't give me a hard time about it. Just give me the damn pages. And just give me the damn pages is one of the best things you can say to someone like me and someone you can say to, to any writer. Because at a certain point, that meant getting out of his own way. That meant not second guessing himself. Mm. That meant sitting down with the guy who was going to employ him, who had a lot of shows going, and uh, being the most dangerous thing you can be, which is yourself. Ben, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, we have one from Sedona about characters and also focusing in writing. What about him? <laughs> oh, I thought Sedona was going to ask the question. Oh, Sedona. Go ahead, Sedona, unmute you and ask not. your question. Yep. Hi, can you hear me okay? I'm clear. Um, so I was wondering, I had kind of two separate questions. So we talked about how um, there's kind of a consensus that characters are so deeply important when you're going into pitching. Um, and my question about that is, what do you do to gauge if a character is just interesting to you as the writer, or if, it, if you feel that they would be interesting to a mass audience? If, when you're going into pitches, how do you kind of gauge that? Do you work on that before, during? Do you just kind of read the room? Mm. I don't think everyone is gonna like all of your characters all the time. I think what makes a good character is uh, somebody uh, that you can make multi-dimensional. And if you really believe in it, maybe the one person you're pitching to doesn't get it and that's okay because like Jewel said, it doesn't mean you need to throw that character or that project away. Who knows someone down the line may um, be just as into it as you are. Yeah, I think I that's, that's helpful. But. It, it's a good point too, to remember that you're gonna have to pitch something a number of times probably, do you know what I mean? So it, it, you, can't, you can't get discouraged, right? You have to keep but trying to and Sedona, one of the things is, I'm sure you've, you've heard this in your classes, is that um, you, you, if you introduce it, like there's this character and she was in my high school and she absolutely drove me crazy, but all the guys liked her. And then describe her, whatever it is, so that there's a personal thing why you should be the one who's going to bring this character to life. Because you, personal experience or, or something, even if it's a bit of a lie, <laughs> see if you can find the personal thing to it. Well, I also think if they're multi-dimensional, is really, you know, I mean, you know, that and they have conflicts and, you know, idiosyncrasies. I mean, depending obviously on the story, but, you know, not flat characters, you know. A really good example of that that you guys have probably heard or seen, um, which is Never Have I Ever, the new Mindy Kaling show on Netflix. Mm. It's so interesting how they've gone in there. And of course, you start with an Indian American young girl. So that's not a character you've seen a million times. And no, no, not like I'm breaking any spoiler alerts, but like she wants to be popular. So she asks the cutest boy in school if he'll have sex with her. Not if they can be friends or go out, but like that's <laughs> a bold move for what you consider to be a shy, quiet girl. And then the story spins out from there. And likewise, the hot, hunk, cute boy turns out to be named Paxton Hall Yoshida. And we don't generally consider men of Japanese descent. He's, he's you know, mixed Japanese and white. Um, hot looking men, but he's hot. And it turns out he's also not just the dumb jock. He has other attributes. So there, she's done a really good job of trying to bring characters that have been far too tropish for too long into a bigger world. So, you know, you got to think about how is my person like this, but also this. The most interesting, interesting thing about a character to me, no matter who they are, uh, is even if it's someone who's successful at, throughout the story is admirable, I think it, the most interesting thing is what's wrong with them. Maybe that says more about me than oh, it does about yeah. writing in general, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean to be dramatized, but you have to sort of have, a, it's, it's, it goes beyond humanizing. It's a phrase that comes up 
in discussing characters is humanizing them. Well, if you have to worry about that, you have a problem because we're not writing characters, we're writing people as far as I'm concerned. Right. And we, yeah. have to, we have to let them be people. And the most interesting thing is the horrible flaw. And um, it's minor stuff like the uh, action hero is af afraid of heights. We've seen that many, many times. Snakes, why does it have to be snakes? <laughs> okay, snakes, uh, it's, it's a perfect example. I think one of the things the cop show genre, and I have a genre expert here who's gonna shoot me down in a second, but one of the things that makes cop movies interesting is not how good the cops are. What, what makes You're cops fine. interesting? Yeah, it's like, I, I know you've heard this a million times, I've written it a million times and I sold it once. And that is, he's a cop who is a, a drunk, B divorced, C a womanizer, D, uh, she, you know, she saw her partner shot in front of her, it goes on and on and on. But I think the flaws can be deeper than that. Yeah, yeah real people- that My flaws are so great is because you want the audience to worry. Once the audience gets to know that character and they know the flaw, then they can be one tiny step ahead in the worry right. category. And they're like going, oh no, oh no, oh no. And that's what keeps them watching. So getting that flaw in your character, it's a really great thing to pitch. Yeah. You know? so, so yes. It, it's, it's almost an opening line in the pitch, really. You know, John Smith is a Green Beret. He's been in combat six times. He knows no fear except for whatever uh that's because we have an we have an image whether we like it or not we're hitting archetypes and we're hitting stereotypes and these things are archetypes and stereotypes for a reason yeah so when that I, duality yeah well you know what they're there because they work and they're there because a the culture produced them you know so why not lead with that and then the punchline being he was abused by his by his mother and cannot stand women. And that's Thank not you. something you Thank think you, about. <laughs> what? I don't know, I gotta think of something. I'm sitting here trying to think of something, but it's not something you associate with a Green Beret necessarily. Mm. And maybe he's chosen that life because there aren't that many women in it. So that's a flaw that can control someone's life. Um, I, I don't mean to insult women or Green Berets when I say <laughs> and, and, and none were hopeful. Um, you know, I'm I gotta just say what's interesting about that. Mm. This is very difficult, I must say, because we end up in other tropes that we don't want to get trapped in. I am frankly so, so sick of brilliant female surgeons who fuck everybody they've ever met. I don't know <laughs> any women who do that. That is not a real woman I've ever met. And I don't okay. want a brilliant Harvard graduated lawyer who can't get her shit together. She you know what, okay, can I, can I just jam off together. that for a minute? <laughs> if I see one more crime show where the female forensic pathologist is wearing fabulous heels, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Cause she's like, she's like walking around in people's innards all day, but, she, <laughs> but there's not a pair of gloves in the room, which is beautifully lighted. You know, it's just, it's like a, NCIS lighting, you know what I mean? Jamie, you've done an NCIS, haven't you? Oh, one of those things. It's like, everything is so, it's a it's a police station that's so damn uh, well. So, so overlit and everything's perfect. And everything's, I mean. But I did do it, I, and it's so funny because when we did Covert Affairs, our lead spy were Christian Louboutins. <laughs> and there's nobody on a government pay, that is on a government payroll, they can, that can afford Christian Louboutin. It was a plot point. <laughs> I watched it too. When, when, I, had when, I, got to, when I, directed, I directed a sequence, I specifically used one of her high heels to kill somebody. Oh, that's just good. Because, just because <laughs> I needed, I just, I had to, I go, God, I hate these heels. So. That's great. When, uh, when I had to write a, an original for, for our MFA program, that's, that's the show I chose. I, I wrote a COVID affairs and uh, because I thought it was a heck of a good show. And that's the interesting thing about those blue sky shows. I guess there was still called blue sky shows at the time. A blue sky spy show is like a weird concept, but with a brush stroke, that could have been a heavy drama. And that would have changed this. I mean, it was the fact that it was, you know, it was USA. So it had to be asked for that at that period of time at USA, it had to be an aspirational spy show. Just imagine. Wow.
the pitch session for that. I don't, I don't know the writers. I'm sure you do. But. Oh, I do. It, it took them, um, it took them a couple of years, and then eventually Doug Lyman um, ferried it into, and Dave Bardis ferried it into NBC Universal. It's yeah, an, Dave, it's Dave had been in a production at at, uh, at NBC at one point, so that would be great. Um, so, so Donna, was there a second part to your question? Yeah, kind of spinning it in a different direction. My second question was, and I've gotten a lot of mixed reviews on this, so I just was curious to see what you guys said. Some people have told me that, uh, you know, you you write something, like you write for one genre and that's pretty much what you do. That's your stick. That's what you do for your whole career. And then some people say you often will get pushed into way outside your comfort zone. Maybe you'll be writing across a bunch of different genres. So I wonder what was, what have your experiences been with that? And is it better to just kind of hone in on something that you're really interested to be working on? Um, I would, I'd love to hear what the other people say, because I have, t I, in my career, I've gone over so many different genres, and it's fascinating for me. Um, but if you're, if you're in that television, you're in a, you're a crime drama writer, is it easier for you to go from one crime drama show to another if you don't take time off to do a, a, a you know, a family show or a fantasy show? I think yes. I don't know. What do you all think? Um, well, I think you get you 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 get pigeonholed regardless. You know what I mean? There'll be that's things true. that you get known for, and that's where you're you're stuck at. I had a uh, a meeting a couple of years ago where uh, they asked me to come over and and they were going to talk to me about a project. And on the phone, the guy said, "We have this really fucked up idea, and we thought of you." <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I guess that's my slot, you know. I mean, but uh, a lot of it is just how uh, uh, we all follow a path of least resistance a lot of the time, and you you do end up, you know, you need to keep working, you want to keep working, and they do start to be similar projects in that sense, genre, you know. Does that make sense? You but know. I think Roseanne, because your experience with panel, I mean, you saw people go from one panel show to another, to another, to another, because it was. They, you know, everyone knew, okay, this, this guy or this woman's good, and they know how to write this genre. Yep, yep. Exactly, and Cannell was considered a writer's production company in that literally you had six floors and he had six shows on, I was an assistant there in my first job in town, and um, guys could walk, and they were mostly all guys back then, let me tell you, they could walk to another floor and say, hey, I'm on Riptide, but I had an idea for Hunter, would you guys be interested? And they all knew each other from hanging out at lunch and they would listen. And so sometimes you'd get a freelance on another show. So they were very, um, but they were all crime shows. I mean, C Cannell wasn't doing a family drama. He wasn't go do a sitcom. He actually tried that at one point and it just, it failed miserably because even the production companies and the networks didn't recognize him for that. Um, and you can get niched even differently. Um, like Warren mentioned, I was on Touched by an Angel for God knows how many years, which was brilliant for my bank account. But um, at the time that I was transitioning out of that, there was a show that was an English show that we were making on Showtime in America, Queer as Folk. And I desperately wanted to be on that show because I knew I had to prove I'm not a Christian girl and that's not all who I am. Um, but my agent didn't even put me up for it. I only found out they were looking for their second season. They were looking for a heterosexual female writer because their whole first season were gay men. And then the demographics showed them that their larger audience was heterosexual women. And so they wanted a heterosexual female writer. And my agent literally said two things that made me laugh out loud. One was, why are heterosexual women watching a show about gay men? To which I said, I get two, two, two naked men in one. Why the hell would I be watching it? And two, he said, Roseanne, I can't believe you wanted to work with a bunch of gay men. And I was like, there were two gay men on the staff of Touched by an Angel. My sister-in-law is gay. Most of my friends are gay. How dare even you accidentally assume that I am the program that I'm on right now, right? I mean, that, but the people, your agent will do that because like Bob said, they want the easiest move. Oh, this is another show like that that will take yep. you. I'll send you over there. I'm not thinking as an agent about building your career. I'm thinking about how much money are you going to make next week? And if that other soft show, girl show, whatever you want to call it, is looking for you, they're not going to try to break into something else. So you have to do that for yourself. This is a Sean Ryan, 
who you know everybody knows from the shield and uh unit right that's his other current show um he started out on a really crappy b-level nash bridges it was a cop show and it was a piece of shit it was don johnson after miami vice and it was a very b-level never gonna win an emmy stupid out. show and he knew he would be stuck in b-show cop hell for life so he wrote a pilot which was the shield simply to show he could be hard ass tough guy and nobody thought he would ever sell it because spoiler alert she is about corrupt cops and at the end of the first episode michael chiklis the head corrupt cop finds out his best friend is going to turn them all into internal affairs and he shoots him dead and sean ryan was like no one's going to buy a show where the cop kills his best friend and they did and now he's hard ass cool mr sean ryan so he wrote himself out of that niche and that was the only way he was going to do it his agent wasn't going to help him do that so you can get pigeonholed pretty easily and you have to watch out for that. Oh, no, I, I agree. I, and Bob, what Bob said, you know, it is definitely the path of least resistance that everyone want, that they want to make anyone above you. And the same thing in, on the production side of it. You get pigeonholed so fast that so it, it's, we make a very hard decision early on on what you want to do because they're not, it's really tough to make lateral moves. You have to make the move vertically and then hopefully why it off more than laterally it off. Unless you're like fortunate when you have somebody in your corner that, you know, that really has that vision for you. Because you know, I saw somebody ask, like, was it better to have a manager than an agent? And I think that, you know, managers are supposed to, you know, be the ones that build the career, but you could find a manager that had that same sensibility that the agent has. So I think it's really the person that's willing to, you know, do the most for you and to like, you know, to really kind of figure out the way to, to get you where you want to go. But as you know, we've heard, you know, people have to, you know, they have to pay their bills. So they are going to make the easiest move, like where you're known already, where they know that they can book you, you know, rather than, you know, spend time trying to do something that might you know, be, you know, just too cumbersome for them nope. or they might not feel they're getting the return. It's your brand at a certain point and you, yeah. you you do it or you don't do it. And you can go against brand. Ben, do we have anything else? Uh, yeah, this one is from YouTube, uh, Maggie Frace. Um, what are some tips for getting a pitch meeting and what are some do's, don'ts for when you're in the room? Unfortunately, I think one is knowing the right person yeah. or person of a per friend of a friend. Um, two, I would say is get yourself noticed. No one's going to help you unless you're helping yourself. I don't know. That's um, what I'm learning is that, you know, someone can get you in the room, but you have to sell yourself basically. Yeah. And um so you can have help getting the foot in the door, but after that, it's all up to you to make it happen. I think people, especially if you're in a geographical area where this, this kind of business is transacted, it's really important. Um, I don't know if our questioner is, it's really important to show your damn face and there's no substitute for it. So the Writers Guild has events that are open to the public and there are other things that you can go, the Academy does too. And it's not, I know it's not, it may sound like a ponderous trail to follow, but. Uh, mm -hmm. was, well, that's me, that's my phone, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, For me, and, I, and, and as Warren is saying is um, just every, you know, don't be obnoxious, you know, don't tackle anybody, don't like, you know, but, no. but just be aware that everything is an opportunity and, mm -hmm. It might not, you might meet somebody and that person knows somebody else and that person isn't Im important, but that person might know somebody else. And so it's just kind of being open to building a network that, you know, sometimes something might open up and um, it's, you know, most writers are introverts, but you got to put yourself out there. Someone recently described me as an extroverted misanthrope and I, I almost had a t-shirt made. Um, yeah, I was going to say it also it also helps in your pitch when you're starting out or anytime um, to uh, find 
uh, partner, not necessarily with someone in the business, but someone that whoever you're pitching to would love to meet. As simple as that. It's like uh, what um, a great idea. I, I was working on a, uh, I'm a former baseball player and I, I had a baseball idea and I went to, uh, you know, the, the major league office and they hooked me up with a couple of players who, who were interested in show business and they came to the pitch meeting and it went great because there's, in, in this case, I think it was Craig Nettles, who was a third baseman, they, they flipped, you know, the pitch was over. We barely got through it and they were like, oh, this is great because they were just so excited that there was an authority there. But everybody can find that even when you're starting out, don't be afraid to, if it's an idea about, you know, whatever, whatever topic you're on, uh, approach, uh, approach somebody that's, that's, a, that's uh, important in that world. Most of the time, after about five calls, you'll find someone who'll say, sure, I'm in, you know, I'd love to do it. So I had the experience on a pitch. A friend of mine is a retired, uh, she's remarkable. She's a retired uh, age, agent. She was a secret agent for the Defense Intelligence Agency. And I brought her to a meeting to sell a show about her. Mm -hmm. And being who she was, she showed up in a suit, a Washington, D.C. style suit with a PowerPoint and briefing books. <laughs> and it really, really worked. And also she had, you know, CIA, I don't know, refrigerator magnets, whatever the hell they were. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it got people to sit up and take notice because, oh, my gosh, she's a real CIA agent, DAA. Right. The guys that did, um, remember that old series, Elf, the alien? Sure. They had a terrible time selling that, right? They pitched it and pitched it and pitched it. And finally, the way, when they sold it to NBC, I think what they did was they had someone build an elf costume and they came and pitched with elf in the room. Oh, that is so <laughs> cute. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's who, obvious. Who I mean, do that? Do you know what I mean? It's like you, you, there, there aren't rules. You just can't, you know, you can't be rude. You can't, you know, but, but, but there's no, the, the rules are rules. It, you know, there, there are no rules. I get what I'm saying. A lot of it's matters and some of it's protocol. Yeah, exactly. But some of it is. <laughs> I hate to I hate to be so blunt about it, but some of it is just darn it how you were raised, and you want to be a polite person. You want to get what you want. Tell people telling people what you want is a big challenge, by the way. Yeah. But you really have to be polite and allow people to be your, allow people allow the people you're pitching to be your partner. Mm -hmm. I've uh, also like I've gotten pitch meetings just by writing a really you know great letter you know, about the project and, you know, all the reasons like why this would make a great movie or a great, you know, TV show. And, you know, like, I mean, where somebody reads it and then, you know, like they're either moved by it or not. So, I mean, that's another way to do it too. Yeah. So, you know, people, you know, you will be able to like, you know, break, get, you know, get through that barrier. I've been, it's, I've been very lucky that, you know, being on the set all the time and having the production execs with you or the studio that you can get that first invitation because I have them there, you know, and I've, I've got them so I can at least begin the conversation. Yeah. Another thing about starting out too, is that, is that uh, any job in show business can lead to a writing job or, or a, because the, if you're, if you're a, a production assistant on a set, you know, that's not, someone will say, on either TV, mostly on TV shows, but movies the same. They'll say to the production assistant, "Well, you you can't want to be a production assistant all your life. What you know? What do you want to do in show business?" And you say, "Well, I'd like to be. I'm I'm a writer." And then they'll say, "I'd love to read something." And I, you know, there's very seldom do do you you, you don't get that response because everybody remembers they were trying to get started somehow. Exactly. And and it's just some kind of foot in the door job. And, and the actor or the director or the producer will say, well, I'd love to read something of yours. You know what I mean? It comes and, down to you have to show up. Yeah, yeah. Most people are nice. You know what I mean? About that. Well, you, you show up and work hard, too. Yeah. I think yeah. that makes an impression on people. You can't just show up and think, well, I'm a PA. Oh, yeah. um, I guess I'm going to do the bare minimum. You have to show up and put in... Yes. Yeah. Put your best foot forward, and that'll. I, I, I always say to the PA, the the one thing you have to do is be the last to leave here. Yes. You mean? Just make sure that, that, that if if someone says I want to read something, you have to have something for them to read. You Absolutely. can't go. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll give it to you uh, as soon as I get it done, or I'll give it to you next month. It has to be the next day. So yep. make sure your scripts are ready. 
And if you get, uh, just to go down that path a little bit, if you give a script to somebody and they read it and they have notes for you, you do those notes the next day and get it back to them, even if you hate them. Because what happens is that person looks at your script now with his or her notes in it and they start to think, boy, he's pretty good, <laughs> you know, because they're looking at their ideas, right? Um, but that's, that's another great way in, you, you know what I mean? I think we have another question, don't we, uh, Ben? Ben, where are you, Ben? Uh, this is Barry. I'll fill in for Ben for a second. I'm sorry. Hi, uh, Barry. So from, hi, guys. So uh, Maggie Frace on YouTube asked, uh, what are some tips for getting that initial pitch meeting? Any, uh, for some, I guess, for someone that isn't used to getting pitch meetings? I think we just, uh, we covered some of that. We did that one. A minute ago. That one got uh, out I think that, already, Barry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm juggling a couple of things. So another one from Brandon McGee, he actually took our, our boot camp in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a routine that is used while leading up to your pitch? Is there a? <laughs> a routine? Take a shower. <laughs> yeah. uh, you mean an individual routine for, for the people doing the pitch? I think, well, I guess, I mean, actors walk around vocalizing. I mean, I, I know we all have our, Actual, if that's what he, if that's the the, the, uh, the caller means, the question means. Yeah, I would, uh, I would also say, you know, um, practice your pitch with friends. Yeah, yeah. Practice it so that you're you're uh, you're doing. You could do it without thinking, if that's the right way to look at it. But I mean, you want to. Uh, lots of times, I'll I'll hear pitches that that you can tell it's the first time they've kind of really been through it for keeps, whereas just simply practicing. You know, it's like acting. Some of it is. Do you know what I mean? Um, and and that's another one. I think we have Thank to you. hold on to the fact that it is performance. You bet. We have another question, uh, uh, Julie. Why don't you ask the first question um, of your two? That's a really great one. Julie, um, go ahead. My and first question: uh, What kind of questions do you find useful to ask the people that you're pitching to during a pitch meeting? that you're pitching to. Um, I would just kind of, just to put everybody at ease at the very beginning and yourself, especially, I used to always kind of try to find something in their office that I liked or that was interesting. There was this executive at, I can't, oh, um, oh, I think it was at the Henson company, Roseanne, I think. She had a, 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 a thing, she had one of those Japanese little sandboxes that she always raked every day and she made it really nice. Uh, this was Lisa Henson. And um, I was nervous about meeting her, but I knew I had something that she would wanna buy. Um, but just to kind of go, oh, that's, you know, just to find something um, and that'll get you a, a minute to just kind of get yourself settled and they'll go, oh, well, this person, you know, just kind of start a conversation. Um, and then you don't really wanna go, well, what do you think, do you like it? I don't know, what kind of questions, I wonder. Hmm. Somebody that we, uh, many of us from Fullerton know, David Morgison, he has a great story about the fact that he always asks the executive, so what are you looking for? Right. And they'll say to you, we're looking for a teenage coming of age comedy coming from this place or whatever. And that happened to him one time because he's really like a hard edged weird comedy guy and Disney invited him in. He couldn't figure out why the heck Disney wanted him. So of course he said, what are you looking for? And they were looking for um, a, a young, you know, a girl show for their teen, whatever. And he started just riffing on a young princess from some South American country that would come to the States and her parents wouldn't know how to behave because they were royalty. And it was a little bit of coming to America with a little girl um, and they bought it. And he, that's not his thing. And that's, he would never would have pitched that. And it wasn't among the things he brought to them. But by saying, what are you looking for? They specifically defined it and he just, made some shit up and he sold it. It became a thing you may have seen on the Disney Channel called Princess Princess Protection League, I think. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah, it was great. And I think that's a great question. What are you looking for? Right. Yeah, notice and, and notice the, you know, invariably there are movie or TV posters in the office, you know, don't, that, that they're, they're telling you what they like. It's sitting yeah, right, that's a good it's point. looking right at you. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anyway. We have to wrap up now and move on to our next mission. And I want to thank everybody for your questions and thank the panel because uh, what can I say? Very, very grateful.
And uh, now I guess we'll be told what to do next. Let's see. Thanks, everybody. To everybody. Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone on YouTube for joining in. Uh, we're going to stop this uh, this panel live stream, and the rest of us here are going to be moving into some mock pitch exercises, which is part of the film career boot camp, uh, normally in Santa Monica this time on Zoom. So thank you all very much for tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you guys on Saturday.